Hi, Daiko. What to say? So warm welcome to Will Reagan. Um, he's a consultant paediatric cardiologist at Evelina London Children's Hospital. He's going to talk to us about paediatric inherited arrhythmia syndrome. Welcome, Will. Oh, hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? I can and we can. Perfect. Perfect. I and mean, you should be seeing the title slide. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for the invite. And, um, and it's a big topic, but um, I'll go through some hopefully interesting stuff. And I've put some um, cases in there that are brief, but I, I, I can't do this without showing some good ECGs. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, a lovely uh, review uh, paper, um, relatively recent and and some of the uh, and summarizes quite nicely in terms of the the arrhythmias, um, the people at most risk and and the times when they're at most risk. And it's, I thought it's quite a nice diagram to start things off. And that's effectively what we're talking about when we're talking about um, inherited arrhythmias in affecting children. There are a few more additional to this, but um, these, these will be the main, main parts and certainly the only ones we'll be covering in this talk. <clears throat> so long QT. Uh, three main types and other more minor types available um, and this is a nice diagram of some of the traditional or the, the typical T wave morphology seen in the different um, in the different types. Um, a lot of you may know this already so some of this will be a summary but um, hopefully there's some interesting bits in terms of specifics to our paediatrics. So I've used um, a few um, a few tables from the relatively recent ESC um, update on um, prevention of sudden cardiac death and ventricular tachycardia. Um, a lot of which hasn't changed hugely since the 2015 guideline, but um, a few bits to point out. And, and again, just to highlight with long QT that probably a lot of you will be familiar with the, the diagnostic score, the SWARC score that was used previously in terms of um, the uh, the diagnostic uh, part of QT of long QT, in other words, what qualifies someone for, and that is typically the persistence of um, QT prolongation in the absence of uh, QT prolonging medication. Um, and then, of course, you can um, consider family history. And I've highlighted that genetics is is clearly key in long QT. And in fact, with a pathogenic mutation. Um, often picked up in family screening um, when a proband's phenotype is secure. But, you know, regardless of your QT interval, um, if you have a pathogenic mutation, then um, by definition you have long QT syndrome. And that's important, and I'll, I'll point out why afterwards. Um, this is a, a, a little graphic from a, a another review paper by Elijah Baer, which is relatively recent. And just to highlight that, um, that one of the, the, the difficulties or the challenges in, in diagnostics of QT is actually measuring the QT interval. Sounds simple. I think in reality this isn't. Um, we see a lot of variation and um, particularly in paediatrics where you've got a heart rate playing a big uh, factor. Um, your RR intervals will, will uh, change your QT quite significantly and you should be quite careful at how you're measuring and how you're correcting. And they talk about the tangent method here and again referred to in a, um, a really um, nice overview paper um, which again it sounds basic but I think this is this is a really nice summary paper of the pitfalls and, and the, the details of accurately measuring and interpreting a QT interval. And there's just some diagrams there showing the, the tangent method taking the steepest slope of the terminal aspect of the T wave down to the isoelectric line. And the genetics are um, are really quite helpful in long QT, and that's not the case for all of the inherited arrhythmias. And in fact, 80% can be um, covered in a very small number of genes, and in fact, this talk and, and most papers concentrate on long QT 1, 2 and 3, which are the vast majority of long QT. And there's been some debate about some of the more minor genes, which you can see listed at the bottom, which are um, there's disputed evidence as to their causality in the absence of QT prolonging medicines. And the general recommendations um, 
have stayed relatively static and the 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 the, um, the really key ones in there are the avoidance of QT prolonging medicines and now Credible Meds has an app which you can give to families um, that they can show GPs, pharmacists, etc. And um, that's really, really useful, I think, and a really good tool for them to take a little bit of ownership and and um, and look at medicines themselves or in, in consultation with the primary care avoiding things that make it worse and that can be quite genotype specific so I've, I've put that diagram back from the review paper um, uh, and from Jonathan Skinner and I think you know typically long QT1 and CPVT are triggered by exercise there is an overlap with all of these and I think that's the, the warning long QT2 has been um, event triggers such as um, uh, sudden adrenergic response um, and on QT3 and Brigada tend to happen in more restful states with high vagal tone. Beta blockers, and this is uh, interesting and, and I think effectively um, most places are giving uh, beta blockers at the majority of ages in children where there is a um, pathogenic mutation in, Q, in the um, QT genes. And I just thought I'd put up, I find the guidelines interesting in how they're worded and how they change over time. And so this is the 2015 ESC guideline um, where you can see that if you have a pathogenic mutation, irrespective of your, of your QT interval, you are considered as having long QT syndrome. And if you go across to the right, you can almost interpret that treatment guideline in two different ways. So you could say, well, beta blockers are recommended for anyone with long QT, and that's a clinical diagnosis, which they specify there. Um, but also there's a, a, a 2A recommendation to say that even in the absence of um, QT prolongation, you can consider beta blockers. The reason I highlight that is in children, I think it is important. This is a really nice paper, which again, I think I would recommend um, people in, in the area to have a look at, because if nothing else, it's a really nice summary only from a few years ago from Johnson Skinner as to the evidence and the risk of um, the different groups within long QT. And not saying that everyone is at the same risk, because clearly they're not. One of the things he points out is that in the absence of QT prolongation, even those gene carriers had an incredibly low event rate, in fact, no event rate before the age of 10. And so he goes on to summarise to say, actually, if the QT interval is consistently low or there's a few other um, high risk features that are absent, in other words, pre-school boy or a pre pubertal girl and certain specific um, genetic mutations are ruled out, then there are a subgroup of patients who may be safe without taking beta blockers. Again, I raise that because I think it's a really common question in paediatrics where um, patients um, are picked up on family screening, the children are entirely well, and you're talking to a family about committing to lifelong treatment with beta blockers. That said, I think the practice is, is um, relatively common that actually as soon as practically possible in the absence of any contraindications, most people with a pathogenic mutation are treated with beta blockers. Um, finally, this is an, another, in, in terms of long QT, this is another one to highlight from Arthur Wilder's paper. Again, this is another nice summary and it talks about um, in part the role of genetic testing in the different channelopathies. And long QT really, I think the role now as we stand is, is that with a good phenotype and the family history intact that actually genetic testing has an incredibly important role to play. That's both in identifying diagnosis as well as some risk stratification. Gene therapy is something to consider in the future and that's not going to be available across the board when you look at the other inherited arrhythmia syndromes. I'll skip over that. That's just a nice summary slide from the new SC. So I just want to show one case of um, long QT just to um, help uh, with things. So this is a 15 year old. Interestingly, he took propanolol until three months prior to that and presented effectively with no family history and a very acute collapse. The doorbell rang. She was frightened because she was on her own in the house. She stood up and collapsed. This is her admission ECG. 
and pretty obviously abnormal. This is the 12 lead on presentation where the QT is out above, well, without correcting, is above 600. And this is what she did overnight in the local hospital before coming across and going on to IV and then oral uh, beta blockers. So this is her on Nadalol. And what's interesting is that um, Jan Till actually uh, from the Royal Brompton was on, um, was helping cover that weekend and came over and said, this, that perhaps this is on QT3, what, why don't we try shortening with, with maxillotine? And, and we did, and it worked. And maxillotine really did bring in the QT interval. This is a comparison on presentation and on a decent dose of the maxillotine, which is a sodium channel blocker. Um, so what would you do here? She presented with a collapse and documented torsades, but on no medication at that point. And what type of QT do you think this is, long QT syndrome? We had bet at the time on QT3. And here's the result. Initially specified as a VUS, in other words, a variant of unknown significance, actually reclassified after we looked into this with our clinical genetics team. And so you thought perhaps that doesn't make sense. This is a this is a long QT2, a potassium channel, and we've given a sodium channel blocker and brought in the QT interval, but actually that is seen in long QT2 and can be helpful in specific patients. I'm sorry, I'm just going to shut the door again. I'm in a clinic room. Sorry, everyone. OK, and Brigada syndrome um, is the next on the list. And again, this is a typical um, ECG taken from Elijah Bear's review paper from 2021. And really the thing to point out in terms of diagnostics is that there is only one diagnostic ECG and that is a type 1 Brigada pattern, significant J-point elevation and negative T waves in V1 to 2. And you can see that shown on the left hand side. And that's either as a spontaneous presentation, which again is important in risk classification, or in, in uh, people with a first degree family member who have undergone a drug, a drug challenge in the UK, usually Agmaline, again, another sodium channel blocker. I'll skip that. Now, the important thing to say for Brugada syndrome is the role of genetic testing is much less clear. And I'll illustrate that with one case, which I'll talk through. So Brugada drugs um, is the main um, thing for them to avoid and again a really helpful website to signpost to families um, and older children that they can always point that out to other medical professionals. Avoidance of certain um, things in their older age group less relevant to uh, paediatrics and again aggressive treatment of fever known to trigger some arrhythmias. The ICD is indicated in either documented VT or aborted sudden death. This is an example from Brigada drugs, including importantly, you should definitely avoid drugs, including Agmaline, part of the basis of the Agmaline challenge. And so one case to show that before I show two slides on CPDT, I'm aware of the time um, because a uh, little bit behind. So this is a, um, a, a, a family where unfortunately, as with many families we see, there's a tragic story at the, at the heart of it, the pro band, which is a, um, a chap who died at age 21 whilst we're on. Family screening was undertaken, including testing the SCM5A, and that was found to be positive and felt to be a pathogenic mutation. So a toy, the two-year-old boy screening went down and was found to have that same mutation, had general advice that we have just been through. Here's his ECG. Perhaps some of you are not familiar with paediatric ECGs, but this is abnormal. There's both a, a slightly prolonged PR interval and some intraventricular delay. So it would, it would say on the face of it, still an abnormal ECG. And this is him during fever. This is uh, about five years ago now and clearly abnormal with a type one pattern, which is um, spontaneous there, um, but in the presence of a fever. This is his halter monitoring with some non-sustained SVT and some sinus node dysfunction. And he went on at this point to have an ICD. Then you look at his family history in more detail, and he's the one down here as the four-year-old. He's got left ventricular non-compaction and a VSD that he had closed when he was younger. 
He's an older sibling who is gene positive and a younger sibling who is gene negative for SCM5A. So she should be great if it was a monogenic disease. The 18 month old sister, she is gene negative for that same SCM5A mutation, collapsed whilst playing with her mother and it seemed pretty unprovoked. And this is her adjuvant challenge. After just over three minutes, it was stopped, but you can see some fairly significant J-point elevation and in fact, diagnostic food brigada. And again, the only subtle change in the guidelines has just been a, a, an increased recommendation for SCA5A and only SM5A testing in the pro band of those with Brigada syndrome. And I think the case illustrates, and I've highlighted it here, that it's really important when speaking and counselling to families to say there is a significant phenotype and genotype mismatch seen in families with SCM5A. So you should not be recommending passing down that screening to first degree relatives, for example. And finally, just a couple of slides on CPPT. I'll skip off the, um, the case example here because it's six minutes past. So CPVT, catecholin, catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, easy for me to say, um, effectively exercise induced or emotion induced bidirectional or polymorphic ventricular tachycardia with a classic example there, unfortunately deteriorating to VF. That's a more typical response that you see on, on provoked on exercise testing, where you see that bidirectional couplets um, provoked during peak exercises. And again, the recommendations have remained relatively, and I say that cautiously, <laughs> um, to avoid extreme or really quite competitive sports, and beta blockers have been found to be very helpful. ICD, again, is a, a, a much more tricky question in CPPT, uh, and in particular in the paediatric group. Um, there have been many recent interesting papers, and I, too much to put in here, I'm afraid, but one of the, um, the international multi-centre registry has put out some really interesting stuff and um, including the really quite um, worrying amount of ICD complications and device related issues, including um, shocks of lower rates of VT when children are still awake, resulting in um, VT storms, which can be really quite tricky to, to, um, to get on top of. Therefore, there's programming recommendations to only shock really quite rapid tachycardias. And also another few things that have come onto the treatment list has been the um, use of flecainide, which is found to be really, really quite helpful in CPVT. The final thing to say is left cardiac sympathetic denervation again also in some selected groups of long QT is found to be very helpful in CPVT and I think we'll probably be seeing it used more in children in the coming years. I'm afraid I think I probably will skip this last case as interesting as it is because it's eight minutes past um, and we'll go to the final side to say any more questions at that point. Thank you so much Will. We've well, got one question here and um, this is from uh, Karenza Evans and um, it, it's not a silly question Karenza. Um, so her question <laughs> is um, uh, she wanted to clarify if genetic testing is organized on a relative who is completely asymptomatic, has a normal ECG and then found to have a pathogenic variant that they would have a diagnose, diagnosis of long QTS rather than a risk of developing long QTS. I guess how are they then classified? Yeah, so so they 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 are treated as a as a um, and this is the really tricky part of the the management of long QT because it also depends on um, part of the reason people I think are cautious with treating people who are gene positive but have a normal QT interval and are leaning towards beta blockers in all of that group is actually it depends on where how and how regularly you're measuring that QT interval. Are you measuring it? Um, on a single annual 12 year ECG? Are you measuring it in a three year old when they're upset in clinic or not upset? Are you trying to do an exercise test and measuring it on lying, standing and an exercise? So I think actually if you really drill down and say, are these definitely normal? Is there definitely normal 
behaviour of that QT interval in all circumstances, I think that is more difficult to say. But but yes, I think you if you have a pathogenic mutation in long QT, you should be you should be classed as being having long QT syndrome, and that's what the, the guidelines will say. Thank you, Will. There's a, a question here, but it's for Ethel. So we'll go back to that during the MDT, and you're coming okay. back on the MDT anyway as well. So yeah. thanks, to, thanks again, and I'm going to pass on to Paz for the next speaker. <laughs>